So welcome um, to tonight's session. I'm excited for all of you all to be here. Um, I typically, if you've done these before, Katie Hurstein is here. I'm actually sitting in for her while she is out of town. Um, but it is really good to see all of you. If you are able again to turn on your video, please go ahead and turn on that video so I can see you're there. Um, and just know that you're here to join us for Inspiring Fu Futures. Uh, my name is Emily Speck. I'm actually the program director at Girl Scouts of Colorado. So Katie's part of my team and we do all the wonderful programs here at Girl Scouts of Colorado. And I actually feel lucky tonight that I get to be um, one of the people here at Girl Scouts of Colorado to be part of this session tonight. Um, I'm so excited for you to meet Erin Kendall um, and just learn about some of the amazing accomplishments she's had um, in her profession and just be inspired about what your future could look like uh, if you chose this profession. And one of our partners that's actually working with us to bring this series to us is College Invest. So you see it right up here on this patch image. And what College Invest is, is it's uh, Colorado's college savings program. So basically it just makes it easy for you to save for education after high school. And that's basically like a fancy way of saying that they just exist for one reason, to help you and your families put away money to save for your own inspired future. So whatever you'd like to do. And this College Invest savings plan is kind of like a piggy bank, right? But it's even better because if you got money from, say, like your birthday from your parents or your caregivers or uh, maybe a friend or family member, you know, you put it in that piggy bank, it doesn't grow, right? It doesn't gain any more money. But if you put it into a college invest plan, it actually grows within there. So it gains more money tax free and it's ready for you when you graduate high school. It's there to pay for education expenses. So your money, this like $1 you put in is getting bigger and bigger. So it'll go further than just sitting at a piggy bank. Um, and it can be used to send you to college, just about anywhere across the country or to a trade school or even for an apprenticeship. Um, anything that really is getting you ready for the real world and get some of this work experience and to be here. Now we're actually going to start with a message um, from College Invest CEO about what they hope to get out of today's session and the series that you all are participating in, okay? Hi, I'm Angela Beyer, CEO of College Invest, and welcome to this episode of Inspiring Futures. Through Girl Scouts, you've learned that if you can dream it, you can do it. And here at College Invest, Colorado's Education Savings Program, we help you get there. And you're never too young to begin to imagine your inspired future. So how will you impact this world? Will you run your own business, invent a new technology, or maybe even discover a life-saving cure? But wherever your inspiration takes you, a College Invest Savings Plan can help make your dreams a reality. Now, prepare to be inspired. Awesome. So that's just a little kind of intro of what that is all about. Um, and I am going to go through a couple housekeeping things before I introduce Aaron. I just saw Aaron pop on video. Hi. Um, so again, as you mentioned, we'll be recording this session. But again, when we post it on YouTube, we actually, you don't see your faces on here. Um, it's focused on our speaker. We also block it out as well. So if you are able to show your faces, what it does is it actually shows Erin that you're here. She's not just talking to a blank screen um, and that there's no one there. Also can see your reactions or if you have a hand raised, if you have any questions. Um, the chat is available for you. So I'll be monitoring that. And I might be putting little comments in there. So if you do have a question or a comment or anything, you can drop it in the chat. Um, let's just test the chat real quick. Go ahead and drop in there your favorite animal. Put your favorite animal in the chat, okay? So it shows me you know how to use it. Ooh, we got lots of cool things. All right. Um, and so you can type it in there. I'm always happy to read it out to y'all, but you can also just unmute yourself, okay? Um, so Aaron will kind of ask you guys for answers or to kind of engage. Just go ahead and unmute. And then we... Um, before every session, we start the Girl Scout Promise and Law. So if you guys want to repeat after me, you don't have to unmute yourself. Um, so we put our three fingers up and connect your fingers like that. So on my honor, 
I will try to serve God in my country, to help people at all times, and to live by the Girl Scout law. I will do my best to be honest and fair, friendly and helpful, considerate and caring, courageous and strong, responsible for what I say and do, and to respect myself and others, respect authority, use resources wisely, make the world a better place, and be a sister to every Girl Scout. All right, so I'm going to pass it on here in just a second to Erin. I forgot you had this great profile picture, Erin. Um, and Erin uh, Kendall is a school programs coordinator at Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Very exciting job. I'm very, I love hearing about it. I can't wait for you all to hear about it. And she manages a statewide program that really allows her to travel to different schools with her team, you know, present on a variety of in-class programs, maybe family workshops, teacher trainings, after school events, virtual classes, all sorts of great things. And her job also includes important aspects of record keeping, managing budget, budgets, communicating to other staff teams, and paying invoices, right? Got to make sure people get paid <laughs> to keep the great work that they do moving forward. So Erin, I'm going to pass it off to you. So I will stop sharing now and you go right ahead. Perfect. Thank you so much, Emily. Well, it's great to see you all tonight. Again, my name is Erin Kendall and I'm an employee with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And I will definitely be asking for you all to help me out with some questions tonight. I'm not just going to talk to you this whole time. Hopefully we'll have some fun and we'll learn some new things together. I also just want to make sure I can um, let's see. And Emily, it appears as screen sharing is disabled. Um, I just tried to share it. So if you would be willing to enable that, um, but try it again, I think it's oh, work. perfect. Okay. There we go. Okay. So I do have a, um, a slide presentation that I'm going to share with you all in just a second here. Um, and I want to be thinking about as a group what Colorado Parks and Wildlife is, and we're a pretty small group, so I will say that uh, you all are welcome to at any point type in the chat if you have questions. Um, also, though, completely fine if you prefer to unmute yourself. And just a second here, I'm not quite seeing my screen. So let me ask you all, as I'm figuring out my tools, uh, what do you think Colorado Parks and Wildlife does our name definitely gives you some hints but what do you think it does any ideas and can you all give me a thumbs up if you can see here let me put it in presentation mode can you all give me a thumbs up if you can see a slideshow that says colorado parks and wildlife I see some thumbs up. Yep, we're good to go. Perfect. Thank you so much, Emily. <laughs> I missed the thumbs up. Okay. You're good. Yeah, I'd love to see in the chat. Let's see here. Um, protects wildlife, helps preserve the forest and wildlife. Okay, really appreciate this interaction. So absolutely. Those are things that we do. And you will even see on this page, we're celebrating our 125th anniversary this year long before any of us were alive or our grandparents were alive back in 1897 is when Colorado Parks and Wildlife was started. Okay, just to make sure it's working, quick thumbs up if you can now see the slide that says we manage state parks. Okay, thank you. Just making sure my slides are working. So one of the things that we do as Colorado Parks and Wildlife is we manage all 42 state parks. So national parks like Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, those are awesome parks as well and there are some in our state, but that is the federal government. So in here at Colorado Parks and Wildlife, we just manage state parks. Uh, so there are all types of activities you can do as noted on this page. These are just a few of the examples, whether you like hiking or camping or just anything outside. And there are a lot of things you can see at our state parks as well. So the photo on the very top is of Rifle Falls State Park. I actually have not been there. I would love to go and see the waterfalls. Um, some people like fishing, some people like to go birding and check out the birds, maybe bring their binoculars. Um, there's some great flowers in season two. So huge variety of things that can be done at state parks because part of our job is to make sure that people have safe places where they can enjoy spending time outside. And then also, ooh, Rifle Falls, that does sound like a fun thing to see when it is frozen. That would be cool. 
Another thing we do, as someone mentioned in the chat, is we manage our state's wildlife. So these are just a few of the examples. People often think of the really big, beautiful mammals like the black bears and bighorn sheep, but we look after small mammals too, like bats, the 17 to 19 species of bats that live in our state, and reptiles and amphibians and different types of fish and birds, so huge variety of wildlife. Could someone help me out in the chat or by unmuting? What is the difference between wildlife and a pet? Wildlife is not treated by humans. They're out in the wild instead of inside a house or a paddock or et cetera. Absolutely. Thank you, Daphne. Yeah, so wildlife, uh, they live in the wild. They have to find food, water, and shelter on their own, whereas pets, we provide food, water, and shelter for them. And, and even if it is like a horse or someone has pet goats, right, we're still providing food, water, and shelter, even if they don't necessarily live in our home with us. Whereas wildlife, whether it's a deer or a salamander or um, a fox, right, they're going to find food, water, and shelter on their own, and they need to. It may be tempting to try to feed the birds bread or, you know, wanting to get close to wildlife, but that food damages them. They're not meant to eat that type of diet. They need to find food that is naturally available in their habitat, and also it helps teach them that people are not here to interact with, right? We don't want them coming right up to us. We want them to stay wild. So those are a few things that Colorado Parks and Wildlife does. Another thing that we do if you want to get more involved is we also have a variety of events and festival, festivals. So there are parks where we teach archery classes. There are parks where we have like cool wildlife themed events like Marmot Festival at Staunton State Park or Elk Festival in the city of Estes Park. So there's a variety of other programs we have going on, either on our website or there are state parks that actually have individual Facebook pages as well. So just if you're interested in learning more, that's a great way to learn a little bit more. And I agree, Caitlin, I love owls as well. Okay, I wanna to switch to talking about careers for a little bit though, because we have a lot of different types of careers at Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I think one of the first careers people often think of are wildlife-based careers, which is definitely a big part of what we do. Only one part of what we do, though. These are ferrets. Does anyone know what type of ferrets these are? Black-footed ferrets. Excellent. These are black-footed ferrets, and they're the most... Yeah, they're the most endangered mammal that we have here. So they were thought to be extinct many years ago, and then they were found again in Wyoming on a small farm. And ever since then, there's been this huge effort to learn about the black-footed ferret and to try to reintroduce them into the wild. So there are places where they are bred, you know, where there are ferrets that have baby ferrets in centers. And then those ferrets are moved to like an outdoor type of training area where they learn how to hunt and they learn how to be wild black-footed ferrets. So pretty cool. Some of you might even have ferrets as pets or know someone who does, but these are completely different from black-footed ferrets, which are completely wild animals. So in this picture, there is a biologist releasing a ferret. So one career in Colorado Parks and Wildlife is being a biologist or some other type of wildlife expert where they're studying these animals, they're learning about them. And a biologist is just someone who studies life. But in this particular case, um, they're studying animal life and more specifically, perhaps mammals. So one pretty cool example, I have a couple others here. So a few other examples of careers in Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Okay, when you see the person on the left in, wearing that bright orange vest and wearing some camouflage, what do you think she might be preparing to do? You use your chat or unmute. For sure, yeah, definitely going hunting. So hunter education is a really important part of what we do. We do have staff that work within hunter education to help make sure that if, if someone's interested in hunting, if they want to obtain their food that way in a really ethical, humane way, right, where the animal has been able to live its whole life out in nature, being wild and free, and then it is taken during the proper season in a particular area um, to help feed people, right? Some, some people might go hunting every single year to feed their family meat for that year. So, you know, if they do eat meat. So hunting and having those rules and understanding how important safety is, is one job that we do in the middle. We also have park rangers. So there are many state parks where there are lakes and where boating is really popular. 
So you might see park rangers going around helping people, maybe checking their fishing licenses, um, in some cases, even doing really amazing and intense work like providing rescues for people that are caught in the water during a storm or something like that. So park rangers are extremely important to Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, the picture on the right is of a couple of district wildlife managers or wildlife officers, and their job is to help protect both wildlife and people and make sure that wildlife have healthy, safe habitat and that people are following the rules if they're hunting or fishing. Um, so you might be able to see in that tarp on the right, that is actually a bear that has been tranquilized. I don't know the entire story. My assumption is that it is a black bear that is being relocated. That's what it looks like. So maybe it either fell from a tree and it's needing to be moved, or maybe it's completely moving location, but the bear is tranquilized or sleeping right now, and then they will move it into a new location. Yeah, absolutely, Caitlin. I love that y'all are participating in the chat. And then a few other careers. There's a ton of other careers within Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I am not going through all of them today. I would keep you all here all night. But there are also people that do really important administration work and accounting and budgeting. We have people that are like amazingly organized and maybe working directly with the wildlife is a little intense for them. Like it is for me too, right? I get to educate, but I don't work directly out in the field every day. Uh, so there are all types of administrative work, helping people understand, you know, what activities are available at a park, helping people with questions they, they might have about fishing or about something they read on our website, or there are people that are like amazing with um, graphic design or amazing with computers, and maybe they run our social media and marketing campaigns, and they're really creative at like putting together brochures and flyers and photos. And so there are all kinds of jobs related to that too. The top photo actually is a picture of me at a school doing a program called cookie mining, which is pretty cool, where we talk about um, the background and impacts of mining in our state. And then on the right is a mentored hunting opportunity. So there are various programs in Colorado Parks and Wildlife where someone does have their um, hunter education card and they're ready for that next step, but maybe they don't want to go hunting. You know, they don't, maybe they don't have someone to go hunting with. It's a great opportunity to go as a group and have a really safe experience with a lot of things provided for them. So those are again, just a few more examples. And then last, but certainly not least, one more example I have is within aquatics. So there are employees that are called uh, fish hatchery technicians. So we do have 19 fish hatcheries around the state. They are open to the public, so you can go visit them, which is kind of cool. And they raise fish. So their job, it depends on the hatchery, but they raise fish from eggs um, into larger sizes that are large enough to actually put into ponds and lakes and rivers and streams. So the people, like all of you, if you go fishing, you have a better chance of catching something. So a lot of people ask like, oh, you know, when I buy something at a store and I have to pay tax, does that money go to Colorado Parks and Wildlife since it is state government? And the answer is no, we don't receive um, general tax dollars to fund our programs. It's actually primarily from hunting and fishing licenses, or if any of you all have ever bought a state park pass before, that's primarily how we're funded so that we have money in order to be able to do things like what you're seeing on this page. So supporting our fish hatcheries and growing those fish up so that they're big enough to live a free life out in whatever body of water is most suitable for them. So these are just, again, a few more examples. So I want to transition a little bit and talk about what I do here at Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So my job is in education. And Emily already mentioned that part of my job is being able to uh, travel around the state, work with our schools, provide trainings for our teachers, uh, maintain and build new relationships with partners. And there are also a lot of behind the scenes things I do. Um, and I think that's important to know too, that most, not all education jobs, but most education jobs do in, um, include a lot of behind the scenes work. I have to be organized. I have to be on top of spreadsheets. I have to uh, maintain a budget. So there's a lot of like tracking and invoice type of duties that I do as well. But I think what's pretty fun that I thought would be way more exciting to show you all than a spreadsheet is the actual education part of my job. So I'm going to show you all a live animal demonstration here. I do not have a mountain lion or any giant animal, but I have a very cool live animal with me. That's actually an education animal 
Um, and she's an ambassador. She lives here in our office. She's not a, a wild animal. And so I wanna go through that with you all. And I'll ask for your input on a few things here as well. Okay, so let's get this started off and I'll make sure to save time at the end for questions too. So this is going to be a snake presentation and I would love it if you could put in the chat, what are some characteristics of snakes? Like what makes a snake a snake? Very true, Caitlin. They do not have eyelids. What else? What else makes a snake a snake? They're cold-blooded and they don't have feet. Excellent. Could you tell me, what does it mean if an animal's cold-blooded? It means it needs to stay in the sun in order to keep warm. Excellent, Daphne. Absolutely. So their body is the same temperature as the air around them, right? Great plus side is they don't have to eat very much because they're not constantly trying to keep their temperature up. But the downside is if it gets cold outside, they just, they can't really move and they'd have to go underground and stay there until it warms up. Okay, so we know they're cold-blooded. We know they don't have eyelids. Yep, they can hibernate together in some cases. Uh, what else makes a snake a snake? Okay, they do slither, that's true. What is their body covered in? Excellent. So all snakes have scales. They cannot blink, right? If you try to have a staring contest with a snake, you will lose because they don't have those eyelids. Um, they generally lay eggs. Not all do, but most do. And what about like bones? So I want you all to give me a thumbs up either with your hand or you can type it or you can do like the thumbs up icon on Zoom. If you say yes, snakes have a backbone, they have a skeleton. Or thumbs down if you say no, snakes do not have any bones. Or, yes. a, you know, hand to the side is cool too. Okay. Not oh my they also swallow their food whole. Definitely. Okay. I think you got it. They do have a backbone or a spine, right? You can feel those uh, bones in your neck as well. You can feel your vertebrae. If you don't feel them, you're all good. I promise you still have them. They also have a skull. So you all can kind of see this photo, right? So they have bones oh. in their face. The they skull on this side is of a venomous snake. The skull on this side is of a non-venomous snake. So they definitely have bones in their head like we do. They uh, have ribs, right? If you feel in your chest, you can usually feel your ribs. Snakes have these go going down the whole way, basically the whole way down their body, those ribs. Okay, if you all also touch your chin real quick, everyone touch your chin. Well, you feel it right under your chin. A jawbone. Exactly. Your jawbone. But if you look at a snake's jaw, I'm sorry, I'm trying to put this against like a... They can therapy. stretch their jaws. Right. And you see they have no bone in the center connecting their jaw. Neither of these skulls have a bone in the center. So if you were a snake, you just be able to keep pushing in. So that's the crazy thing about snakes is not just flipping that jaw downward, but also outward so that if we were like snakes, we'd actually be able to swallow a basketball hole, which I think is crazy. We're just not adapted for that. But for snakes, it's no big deal. And this photo is actually of an x-ray of a snake, one of our snakes. And I think it's kind of cool to see the spine. You can see the ribs going down the snake's entire body. If you all see, do you see that kind of dark pocket? Almost looks like a long oval that's a little bit darker colored. Yeah, so that the veterinarian told us. So we, we have a special snake veterinarian, right? You cannot just take a snake to the same vet that sees your dog or cat because they may know not really anything about snakes. So we have a special snake or exotics veterinarian. And she said, oh, that's actually just gas. So our snake was a little uncomfortable, but she just needed to pass some gas. You know, happens to the best of us, I guess. Okay, so what I would like to do, oh, before I take our, our aunt snake out, um, something that often gets mentioned too is the shed. So all snakes shed their skin. Now we lose skin cells as well, right? If I like shower or if I even just do that to my arm, we will lose skin cells as well, but not all at once the way a snake does. You can kind of see the scales on the belly are long and wide. It's like rungs on a ladder, right? And that really allows the snake to move. As they slither, they push off those different scales on their belly. It's almost like doing the army crawl a little bit. Whereas the scales on their back, let me see if I can get this in the 
in the view are much smaller. And if you'll actually touch your fingernails really quick, your fingernails are made of keratin. That's the type of protein. And that's the same protein that snake scales are made of. So kind of cool that we have more in common with snakes than we might think. Yeah, okay. I have a lizard and he sheds, but he sheds small patches, not um, all at once. So snakes totally. are different from some other reptiles. Definitely. Yep. So yeah, it depends on the type of reptile. Snakes are a type of reptile, just like lizards and turtles and crocodilians. But some of their adaptations are a little bit unique. And Athena, to my knowledge, we don't have keratin in our nose. I could be wrong. But we do have cartilage in our nose. And yes, keratin is hair made of hair. Excuse me, our hair is made of keratin as well. And this part of our nose that we can move is made of cartilage. Okay, um, so let me go ahead and get our live snake out. And if you know what type of snake it is, I'd love for you to put it in the chat. And it's also okay if you're like a little uncertain about snakes. Um, that's completely fine as well. But this is, again, a type of snake ambassador we use that is really used to being around people. Let's go ahead and pull her out. Um, and I'm go see. To stop screen sharing for a minute. I'll... I just want you to be able to get a closer look at her. Okay. And if you think you know what species she is, you can go ahead and put it in the chat. Well, snake. Oh, awesome. Great. Gosh, you all know a lot. Absolutely. So she is a bull snake. So let's see. Because this group is very knowledgeable, I want to see if I can stump you, at least eventually. So is she venomous or non-venomous? Not venomous, non-venomous. Non-venomous. So how does she eat her prey? Um, she catches it with her mouth and then she walks her mouth around to the head because the head is easier because um, when you pet an animal, its fur goes down backwards. And so it's easier for a snake to eat it that way. Definitely. So she's a constrictor, right? Most snakes are either venomous or constrictors. There are some snakes that are kind of neither. They just start eating it. They don't actually really even squeeze it first. But most snakes, especially snakes that are eating larger prey, are what we call constrictors. And why do they stick out their tongue? She's been doing the that smell. a lot. The smell. Totally. Okay. And then why is their tongue kind of shaped like a fork? So that it can smell in different directions? Absolutely. So it allows her to smell in different directions. And if some of you all have learned the term in math of surface area, snakes oh, yeah. have that forked tongue. So they have more surface area, right? If you imagine that forked tongue, there's more space on their tongue where air, air molecules can attach, gives them more um, surface area. And yes, the Jacobson's organ, I saw someone, I think, write that in the chat, is part, it, it's right in their head. Um, within their brain, and the Jacobson's organ tells them what it is they're smelling. So you can see she's not at all being aggressive right now. It's just her being curious, right? Just like for most of us, we might look at her, even though we already know what she looks like. She's doing the same thing. She's smelling her surroundings. Um, most snakes don't have very good vision. So for them, that sense of smell is pretty key to be able to use. Um, okay, who could tell me out of all snakes on the planet? So let's go beyond Colorado. Uh, are most snakes venomous or are most snakes non-venomous? Non-venomous. Most snakes are non-venomous. Awesome. Corbell, do you know about how many, like if we talk, if y'all have already learned percentage or fractions, um, what percentage? Do you know like very, very roughly? I'm going to guess about 10%. That's an excellent guess. So it's about, and that's not too far, Um, it's about 25% of snakes on earth are venomous, 75% of snakes on earth are non-venomous, but even most venomous snakes are not actually dangerous to people, right? There's a lot of snakes that have but venom, they, but they it's not necessary. They use kill their food, but they, they um, like a rattlesnake gives us a warning before it bites. It wants us to stay away. It's scared of us. Totally. You got that correct. Okay. And again, you all are amazing. You know so much about snakes. So let's see if I can quiz you. Oh, and I will answer your questions, Caitlin, in just a moment. Does anybody know you can write them in the chat? 
the types of rattlesnakes we have here in Colorado, any ideas? Uh, Eastern and Western. Oh, what was that? Say that again. Eastern rattlesnake and Western rattlesnake. There is one called the Western. The most common rattlesnake here in Colorado is actually called the prairie rattlesnakes. We don't actually have diamondback rattlesnakes in our state, but they are, are located elsewhere in our country. So prairie rattlesnakes are pretty common, but exactly like you mentioned, Corbell, they don't want to bite us. They're not out to get people. It's just that if they do feel scared, if they do feel threatened, they will defend themselves. They absolutely can, you know, rattle that tail and really put on a show so that they'll be left alone. So I'm gonna go back to sharing my slides and I wanna share a slide. Can you all see now the comparison of bull snakes and rattlesnakes? Yeah. Perfect. The rattlesnake has less um, color variation. Yes, yeah, so you can definitely use this to kind of look at a few differences, right? In Colorado, any potentially dangerous snake is going to have a rattle. You could technically argue like a tiny newborn baby rattlesnake is not gonna have much of a rattle, it's just gonna have a little button. But there's still going to be something on its tail where the whole thing has. You can see. I don't. Absolutely I don't. No see. rattle. And generally, bull, bull snakes are more of a yellow color too. Now, I always say, just give animals space, right? It can be hard to tell sometimes unless we're really close. And this rule of like, oh, does it have a rattle? Or oh, rattlesnakes have a diamond-shaped head. That doesn't really work beyond our state, right? Because there are other snakes that are venomous like coral snakes and they don't have a diamond shaped head either. But in the state of Colorado in general, a snake with more of that diamond shaped head and that has a rattle, pretty much a giveaway. Whereas if it doesn't, it's probably not venomous. So, okay, so I have to answer a question because there's a really good question about why is she not in the wild? That's a great question. So this snake was actually donated to us. So there was a museum that had a live snake program and as they were ending that live animal program, they were looking for good, responsible and knowledgeable homes for their animals. And so we were one location. So this snake, as you can see, is super used to people, right? So she actually just lives in a tank, has her own enclosure here in the office. Um, I wanna show you all though, how we know she's female. Okay, can you all see this next page? So Horus is her name. Someone asked if she has a name. And she gave us a bit of a surprise a couple months ago. And she actually started laying eggs. And we had been told and thought that this snake was actually male, right? I mean, about 50% of animals on earth are female, roughly 50% are male. So we didn't know for sure. But then we find these eggs in her cage and we're like, okay, well, that's a, that's a giveaway. It's a female. And you can see in the top left picture, she's getting right about ready to lay the egg. And it, and then below that. Uh, I can see the actually, egg inside of her. What was that? I can see the egg in her. It's Absolutely. The and then you can see where she actually laid it below that. And then we provided her a nesting box where she laid a bunch more eggs. So um, there was no male present, so these eggs would not turn into baby snakes. There was just a yolk inside. So they were essentially, essentially empty. Like if you all eat eggs at home or use them for baking, they're from hens, haven't been around a male. So those eggs would not turn into chicks anyway. They're just empty, essentially full of that yolk. So while there were no baby snakes, we bet that Horace here was pretty tired after all of that. So we've been feeding her a little bit extra over the past few weeks. Okay, and then I think I have just one or two more slides here. Um, this photo is just a great photo of what some of her habitat might look like. So again, while this is an education snake and an office snake, uh, bull snakes in the wild would love to live along grasslands, Great Plains. They can burrow underground in the winter, find another hole that another animal may be used to stay nice and warm. They also can find plenty of food to eat and do rodents out there. So that, this is really a picture of what their habitat might look like. Okay, now I would like to ask you all, what should you do if you see a snake in the wild? Leave it alone. Um, watch it from a safe distance where you are not bothering the snake. Um, don't like poke it or touch it. Um, and, um, yeah. If you can rattlesnake, slowly back away um, so that you are letting it know that you don't want to hurt it. 
I think both what you said and what I'm seeing in the chat is awesome, right? Just give it space. It doesn't matter if it's a rattlesnake or a little baby bunny or a coyote. Wildlife wants space. They don't want to have to interact with us. So that's exactly right. Slowly backing up, just giving it space. I have seen rattlesnakes a couple different times because I grew up here in Colorado, like on a trail. I didn't try to, you know, run past it or anything. I just gave it plenty of space. Um, I was able to, you know, safely walk around it, but I did not try to go up to it. I did not try to move it. I did not try to kill it. I just recognized, hey, I'm in its habitat too. It deserves to be here just as much as I do, but I don't want to try to interact with it. Don't want to try to scare it. Uh, so we just gave each other space and it worked really well, right? So good general safety tip. Okay, one other question, because again, you all know so much and I love that. Uh, why are snakes important? Could anyone write that? Well, they, they eat rodents, which otherwise, since they, ha they have so many babies, they could take over and there could be too many rodents. Um, also, they, they just help get rid of pests um, who spread diseases. Totally great idea. Thank you, Cribble. Does anyone else have any other ideas of why else are snakes important? Rodent control is huge. Any other ideas? Could animals eat them as well? Could they be part of the food web? Mm -hmm. they're, so they're an important source of food for animals like hawks or coyotes, or especially when they're younger and they're smaller, all types of animals, maybe even other larger snakes could eat them. So they're an important part of the food web. Just like you said, Caitlin, they totally balance the ecosystems. Um, as cool, like I love pet mice and pet rats. They're super cool. But in the wild, some types of wild mice and rats do carry diseases that people can get. They eat our gardens and our crops. So we do need natural predators like snakes just to help keep that in check, right? There's no animal that's like bad. It's just that uh, just like Caitlin said, they provide balance to ecosystems, whether they're eating rodents, whether they're being food for other animals. And I think it's kind of cool, too, that there are many types of snake venom that are being studied for medicine, for medical research, to potentially help people with conditions ranging from uh, um, heart conditions to pain and management. And that's extremely important, too, that snakes that are venomous can help people. Uh, yeah, did you have a question, Corbell? Yeah, how could venom help? um like help people feel better like that that's a great question so the key here is that when i say it's being used in medical research it is not that just the venom by itself would be given to someone as a medicine absolutely not right it's more that when we look at venoms we realize there are so many different compounds so many different types of proteins in one venom source and that if we learn how to separate those different proteins and compounds, we realize, wow, there's some incredible things snakes naturally make in their bodies. Again, those snakes that are venomous, which is only about a quarter of all snakes on earth, that um, do have really interesting properties that potentially could help people. So, and similarly with spiders too, someone mentioned they used to have um, a pet tarantula. I love spiders. I think they're so cool. I used to be really afraid of them though. But yeah. then upon learning, like, well, there are some types of spiders, too, that are being studied for um, help with people who may have diabetes or who have various health conditions of certain parts of the venom that um, have some pretty cool uh, properties that can help people as well. So there's all kinds of things we can learn from wildlife. Those are just a few. Um, OK, I've been talking for a while. You all have, again, been a fantastic audience, so I appreciate it. I appreciate everyone's participation since we are a smaller group tonight. I would like to take some time to, first, let's, we can do questions about either Horace or like wildlife in general, and then we can make it, just open it up and make it very general. I think I saw someone who asked, how long does it typically take for snakes to lay all their eggs? It's a great question, and it totally depends on the snake. There are some snakes that within 24 hours, they've laid all their eggs. Um, in the case of Miss Horace here, she laid the first egg like in March and the last egg, she laid nine total. The last egg was laid like over a month later. And we thought that was pretty unusual and pretty abnormal. Keeping in mind, again, the eggs would never hatch because there was no male present, so no baby snakes. But we thought that was kind of odd. Some of the eggs looked strange. So we actually did take her to the veterinarian. I think I mentioned it was actually her x-ray you saw 
to make sure that she was done laying eggs. Um, what other questions do you all have? And we can totally go ahead and open it up to keep typing if you're typing. Um, but I am going to go ahead and see if I can. Oh, I'm just scrolling through to see if you can get the name. Perfect. Okay. okay. And I think I am not sharing my screen. So I think we should be good there. Um, just want to make sure you can see Horace still. And yeah, if you all have any questions about what I do or what people in Colorado Parks and Wildlife do, I just love to hear I, from you. I have a question about snakes. Um, since they eat their prey whole, can their bones and ribs stretch out um, to get it to go down? To yeah, that's a great question. So they don't have bones that are tight and stuck in one place. Uh, that encircle the whole body is the key. So like Horace here, you know, she has her spine that goes down her back. She has ribs on either side, but the ribs just kind of like hug the side of their, her body. They don't go all the way in completely touch and encircle herself. So to answer your question, yes, this is what allows her to stretch. Her skin is really stretchy as well. They do not have oh, yeah. a slime or mucus. They just have smooth skin. So that yeah, will I've stretch as well as all their muscles. I have seen a snake skin like stretch out. Also, on my lizard shed skin, I can see um, like how much space there is between the scales. For sure. And I just see another question too. Someone asked, why did you choose to work for Calder Parks and Wildlife? That is a great question. And I love a couple different things. So I love education. I love biology, which again is the study of life. I love um, working with people. So I thought, okay, what ways can I combine my interest in biology and science, my interest in working with people, my interest in educating? Like, I love being able to take, for example, an education ambassador like our bull snake here and maybe helping people that are a little bit afraid of snakes, but that want to learn more and perhaps see them as not quite as scary. I love doing things like that. So for me, Colorado Parks and Wildlife was an organization I'd heard about um, when I was younger and that I'd heard about in like earlier jobs I had when I worked seasonally different places. So I knew that they had education types of positions. So I, you know, I'd studied biology in college. I uh, knew some of the staff at Colorado Parks and Wildlife and was able to learn more and eventually apply for a job. And some people find opportunities through networking or through maybe volunteering somewhere where then um, some people already know them when they actually apply for like a position within the company. Um, okay, how did you get to work in this job? What made you want to work here? I think I mostly answer that. So I have, again, my degrees in biology. I also was kind of interested in education in college. So I took a few education classes. You don't have to, right? It's not like I had to take certain classes to get this job, not that way at all. But I did get a lot of experience. I did have a little bit of experience volunteering at just like a local park to where I lived that had a little bit of like a, a really cool nature center. So I had some of that experience already. I um, a place in Louisville where I live. Okay, and I'm sorry, Corbell, I, I'm, I love the stories, but just for right now, I wanna try to stick with questions because I do see there's a few other ones in the chat, okay? So for okay. now, let's see, I think there's another question on what college classes and high school classes did you take to be able to work in this job? Another great question. So within high school, I really just took a lot of the standard courses that were recommended. I knew I enjoyed biology in high school, but I didn't know necessarily what I wanted to do with that. So I really just tried to explore in high school and I encourage you all to do that too. I mean, granted, maybe some of you know exactly what you wanna do, which is also cool, but a lot of us don't, or maybe we have interests, but we don't know how we wanna apply those. So I encourage you to explore a bit. I learned that I really liked biology. And so I thought, okay, I want to go to college somewhere where I can learn more. And then I did. And I went to school. I actually was in Florida for college and I enjoyed it. But I realized like, you know, I don't um, just want to focus on one type of biology. And gosh, even though I love learning about animals and science, I didn't want to be necessarily inside or in a lab all day. And I thought, is there a way I could combine 
animals with um, also that I really enjoy working with people. And so that's kind of how I looked into environmental education. All right, any other questions? I'll also welcome Emily if you have anything you'd like to bring up too. I'm happy to um, answer anything. Um, I one said, do you have any of your own pets? Do you have your own personal pets? Yeah, I do actually. I have a few pets. I have a dog. I'm, the uh, normal pet I have is that I have a golden retriever. She's 14 years old. Her name is Sadie, and I, I love her a lot. We go hiking together. Uh, I actually also have a few tarantulas as well, which is kind of the unusual pet. Um, I totally encourage you all that before you ever consider getting a pet, whether it's a captive bred snake, right? So a snake, not from the wild, but from like a breeder or a tarantula or a hamster or any pet is to definitely do your research, right? Because Horace here is about 11 to 12 years old. She can live another 10 years easily. They can live to be over 20. So thinking about, and same with tarantulas, actually, female tarantulas can live to be 20 years easily. So I always encourage people, I do not encourage people to get exotic pets. Um, I encourage them to do their research and think like, wow, I think snakes are so cool. I do too, but where will you be in 10 years? Are you still going to want to take care of the snake? Are you okay with feeding it mice? Like right with my tarantulas, I have to feed them crickets. I have to house them separately. I have to make sure the temperature is correct. I have to make sure they always have fresh water. And I'll probably have to do that for another 10 years or so. So while I love pets, I just always have to put that plug into of just make sure to do research before considering getting a pet. Um, I, they do have names. Yes, I have Violet. And then um, I'm a Harry Potter fan. I don't know if any of you all are, but Horace, Horace Slughorn is named after Harry Potter character. One of my tarantulas is named Minerva after Minerva McGonagall too. A bit silly, but. Any other say, quick question for you. So if someone was like, ooh, this is something that I want to do, like maybe they want to work closer with animals or like handling snakes like that, what, how would they get started? How would they get interested in maybe experience with that? Great question. So a few things to consider. One thing I recommend, this may not be accessible to everyone, um, if you have the ability, though, to maybe volunteer, whether at a nature center, um, for example, like Bar Lake State Park, this is in Brighton, Colorado, near Denver, they have some live animals in their nature center, and they do have teen volunteers um, that come in and help take care of those animals. So that's one example that comes to mind. I know a lot of zoos have programs like this as well. Um, for youth, again, you don't have to be an adult to be able to take part in volunteer programs. Not everyone can volunteer, and that's okay, too. Even just have, you know, doing a little bit more research, looking online, there's some great resources. For example, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, that's AZA. I know they have various internships and resources. Um, something I did too is just like looking online of, yeah, what are animals, um, where, where centers maybe that rehabilitate animals or that have live animal programs and just learning more about the animals in my area. Then I kind of combine that with, okay, I know this is an interest of mine. You know, what classes can I take in the future that might be a good fit? And then I just also encourage you all, if possible, to be open to different opportunities because there may be um, some opportunities that are, say, internships or that are seasonal. And that does have its downsides, right, of having to try to find work again after that seasonal position ends but it also really gets your foot in the door with companies of going like, oh, hey, this person who, you know, they have a seasonal job, they're very young, but they're very interested and excited. And that's how I got into Colorado Parks and Wildlife is I, I had some former work in this field. Um, I worked as a temporary employee to learn if this was the right fit and get some of those shadowing opportunities. And then later on was able to apply for a permanent job. I just was laughing at the comment in the chat. <laughs> oh, yes. There's some discussion around Harry Potter. Yes. Yes. <laughs> like, not a small spider, but good to know, right? Like spiders couldn't actually grow that big on earth. They don't have bones. So, you know, good to know. I love that. Any other questions, Girl Scouts? You can come off mute if you would like to. These have been great. It's been a great conversation.
Yeah, lots of great questions. I'm super impressed with you all's background knowledge. And you kind of answered this, were you, like when you were younger, were you like, this is what I want to do? Or did something spark for you? Yeah, I, I loved animals when I was young, but I definitely didn't know this is what I wanted to do. I've always loved animals, but um, when I was younger, I liked more of the, like the fluffy animals. And I really liked frogs and toads, but I definitely was a bit more afraid of like insects and spiders, for example. And what helped me like, especially for those of you out there that are just like me when I was young, where I, I mean, seriously, throughout high school, I was still like, oh my gosh, it's a wasp, I'm going to run away, you know, is that I just did research on these animals of like, okay, spiders kind of scare me. Are they really that dangerous? And I learned like, wow, there's only four types of potentially deadly spiders to people on earth. Most spiders are not even harmful. So that's just another recommendation of if some of y'all are curious, I love curiosity. I think it's so important. You should always ask questions and challenge um, ideas out there. So um, I didn't know I always wanted this field, but I think my curiosity helped to get me here. Awesome. Well, I don't think of anything else. I don't see any other questions. Girl Scouts, can you guys come on video real quick? Unmute yourself and give Erin a big thank you. And I have thank one you. last question before you hop off. So go ahead and say thank you. Got oh, get him in the chat. I, I've got a poll that I'm thank you. To. Good job. You're very welcome. All right. Go ahead and answer the poll for us. You'll see it pop up. So the first question is, is this a job you're interested in for your future? And the second one is, did this session get you excited about your future and what it might look like? So answer those two questions. All right. Looks like everyone was nice and excited. Love it. All right, and then just, I got too many screens open right now. Just a reminder, Girl Scouts, that if you are working to earn the patch, um, this is what the patch looks like. Um, so the center pieces after you attend the first program, and then the outside, what we call the rockers, you can earn as you do the themes. I was kind of debating, I was like, I guess it could be a little outdoors, it could be a little STEM, this one can fall in either one, I think. Um, and so you can purchase that in the shop. And then just a reminder is that we are going to be going on summer break for this program. So we'll kick things back up in August. Um, keep checking your emails, we'll announce new um, speakers, and then also we'll send an email right after this with a survey. Um, so make sure you take that survey and share any ideas that you might have of future speakers, okay? All right. Thank you, Girl Scouts. Thanks, everyone. Bye.